All right, so this session is going to look at the why of skills-based health education. Before we dive into the content, I want to tell you a little bit about who we are. I'm Sarah Bennis. I'm an associate clinical professor at Miramac College. Right now, I'm teaching courses such as Introduction to Public Health and Health Behavior Promotion. So I switch a little bit to the public health side of things. Uh, but before I came to Merrimack, I was at Boston University running our health and physical education teacher preparation program uh, for six years there. And Holly Alperin won't be joining us on this in this session, uh, but I want to introduce her as well. We're partners and colleagues uh, in this skills-based work. Um, and so, you know, all of everything that we do, you know, skills-based wise um, is coming from our work together. So she won't be joining us, um, but want to make sure we give her a shout out. Uh, Holly is a clinical assistant professor at the University of New Hampshire. And before um, she went to University of New Hampshire, she was at the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed in Massachusetts. I also want to make sure that I mention the products that we have available through Human Kinetics that can help you on your skills-based health education journey and that much of this information stems from. The first is the Essentials of Teaching Health Education, Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. This is the foundational text that explains more about the why, what skills-based health that looks like, and gives some examples of what a program that is skills-based may, may look like. The other two resources are lesson planning text where we provide units that include assessments and unit plans um, and lesson plans for each of the national health education standards. And we've used ideas and lesson plans from many teachers in the field to help build these resources. So again, these might be helpful for you um, as you work on your skills-based programming. I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the unique and challenging situation that we all find ourselves in right now. But I wanted to acknowledge it in the frame of both that there is a lot going on that is changing our lives, changing the way things are going. Um, it may feel chaotic, uh, certainly it's disruptive, um, but that in the midst of, of chaos, there is also opportunity. And I think these online modules are an example of that, um, and I'm sure you have, as, as I have, you've seen all sorts of ways that people are coming together and supporting each other through these times. So to offer some perspective, um, you know, and just remember that we do have opportunities even when things are tough. And hopefully uh, this short presentation will provide you with some helpful information that will continue your professional growth around skills-based health ed. Thank you for taking this opportunity uh, to continue to advance and grow and learn. All right, so what is the goal of this presentation? I'm hoping that you will be able to describe at least three reasons why a skills-based approach to health education is an effective approach after this presentation. It's gonna be a quick overview. Uh, I could talk for hours and hours about why skills-based health education makes sense, but hopefully this will provide you with some of those high-level reasons uh, that you can use to help you, but you also might want to think about how you would use this information to talk to administrators or talk to parents as you continue this journey and, and you know, your colleagues as well, um, because you, ideally you're bringing everybody on board with you, whether even if you're sort of working independently, hopefully everyone's moving in that direction, or maybe you're going to use this to spark some time for your staff to work together, um, you know, in whatever capacity makes sense. So hopefully this will give you something to think about uh, and some ways to advocate for a skills-based approach to health education. Holly's presentation is going to go more in depth about the specifics of what we mean when we talk about skills-based health education, but I wanted to provide an overview of skills-based health education here in case you maybe didn't watch Holly's presentation first. So. A skills-based approach to health education is a culturally responsive or culturally sustaining, trauma-sensitive, student-centered approach to health education in which the focus and emphasis is on the development of health-related skills. So briefly, the shift is that we are taking the national health education standards, seven of which are skills, and we are using those as our units, and in our units we are working on skill development not just knowledge acquisition. So we include 
topics or health information as a way to support the development of skills. But it's important to acknowledge that we need to be doing this in a culturally responsive or culturally sustain and or culturally sustaining way. We need to be doing this through trauma sensitive approaches and student student centered approaches. So it isn't just the putting skills on top um, and it isn't just transitioning to be more hands on learning or activity based. It's a, it's a whole different paradigm of the way that we look at and think about health education. The first reason that we're going to talk about here is health literacy. Health literacy is a concept that actually comes out of the public health and medical space more than health education, but we're beginning to realize that there are many opportunities for health educators and health education to support the development of health literacy as the field transitions to a more skills-based approach to health education. So health literacy entails people's knowledge, motivation, and competencies to access, understand, appraise, and apply health information in order to make judgments and decisions in everyday life concerning healthcare, disease prevention, and health promotion to maintain or improve quality of life during the life course. So you'll see these verbs to access, understand, appraise, and apply, not only do those align with some of the national health education standards directly, but when you think about all the skills together and when you think about the ways that a skills-based program is going to help students develop and practice these skills, we can see the connections here. And one of the reasons why this is important is because there's a lot of research that shows that levels of health literacy directly impact people's health over a lifetime. So we can help students develop these skills that they need to be healthy not just now, but over a lifetime. And it's also important as health educators that we think about advocacy. So being able to say that our programming is going to support health literacy, which is something that is a well-researched concept that we know does impact health, can be really useful as we want to advocate for more time in our programs or even for the existence of our programs at all. This slide just summarizes some of the key points about how health literacy aligns with skills-based health ed. The first is that health education supports health literacy, particularly when the focus is on skill development because skills are an integral aspect of health literacy. When we use a skills-based approach and when we integrate this concept of health literacy in here, uh, it's going to help promote transfer into real life. We, we have to be health literate in so many different ways and different areas over our lifetime, so it really shows students how these skills that we're learning in the classroom can apply outside of the classroom. And as mentioned before, it can have a positive impact for students both now and in the future. Reason number two, health behavior and learning theories. Okay, so health behavior theory tells us a few things that support why skills-based health ed makes sense. The first is that no health behavior theory suggests that knowledge alone cha changes behavior. It just doesn't. We do need to know certain things. We need to know things that aren't health promoting. We need to know ways that we can engage in health promoting habits, what strategies are health promoting. We might need to know where different resources are. But at the end of the day, knowing alone is not gonna change behavior. One theory actually suggests that knowledge is a precondition to change. So just like I mentioned, if I don't know what I'm doing is risky to my health or potentially harmful to my health, why would I stop doing it? At the same time, if I don't have the knowledge to change my behaviors, then I can't do anything. But it's never alone going to be the thing that is going to help me make a change. So it's a, it sets the stage. It's a precondition to change, but it's not going to affect change on its own. So we need to spend time in health education thinking about some of the things that do work. So we know that self-efficacy is a construct that directly relates to behavior change. So if students feel more confident and competent uh, in skills such as decision-making, advocacy, accessing valid and reliable information, all skills in the national standards, they're going to be more likely to use them in their real life and they're gonna be more likely to be successful. We know that skills like goal setting are, are helpful in all sorts of different areas of our lives. We need skills to overcome barriers and obstacles, both you know, in, in our maybe more immediate context and environment and really thinking about this bigger picture, right? Our health is situated within this larger construct of so many different factors and forces that impact us. And so really helping students see where they fit into this bigger picture and what are some of the barriers that people might face and what are some barriers that, that people 
um, certain people might face versus others and really getting into some of the um, bigger, deeper issues and root causes. Um, and then we need things like skills to manage our influences. Again, you know, both those close to us and those um, beyond maybe the bigger policy environmental level. And these are just to name a few. Uh, but we do know from health behavior theory that these are the kinds of things that we need to be focused on when we want to think about supporting health behavior change. And our job as health educators isn't necessarily to make students change behaviors, but we can give them the tools to understand how to do this for themselves. And we can support their ability to develop their skills in an authentic way so that they have the ability to support uh, behavior change, you know, when it's appropriate and when it makes sense and when they might need to use it. So if we're going to be honest, you know, this relates back to what we talked about in the previous slide, we do things that we know we shouldn't do for a variety of reasons. Um, and sometimes, you know, it's because we're stressed or we're tired or we're happy or whatever. Um, but we're doing it anyway. And it's not that we don't know that we shouldn't be doing it. Um, Another reason why focusing on the skills makes a lot of sense is that information is always changing. That's our life right now. Um, you know, we're learning new things all the time. Access to the internet and the way that we now, you know, get information is just totally changing and we're learning new things every day. Um, youth typically have more access across the board, but they aren't as good at being discerning um, about, you know, what is real and what is not. And certainly right now in this current context, uh, this means a whole lot more. Um, you know, it always has been important, but we're seeing so many examples of this right now. So we need to help students, you know, learn these skills and, and be able to uh, develop these strategies to be able to figure out, um, you know, what is valid and reliable information and what isn't. Um, and at the end of the day, information can't meet the needs of all students, but skills can because we're all in different places. And so even if you look at something like nutrition, we're all going to need something a little bit different related to our nutrition based on so many different factors. So you telling me something isn't going to be as impactful as you giving me the skills and tools that I would need to be able to figure out what I need for myself and then how I can go and get what I need. So at the end of the day, the skills are always going to be not only the most transferable, they're always going to be the most relevant. There's not really a time in our lives when we're not making decisions or analyzing influences or trying to, you know, self-manage with different behaviors. And, and so we give them these tools and strategies that we know are going to be relevant over a lifetime, though they may look different, the skills themselves will transfer. And finally, learning theory tells us a few things that support skills-based health education as well. One is that student-centered learning that is culturally responsive and culturally sustaining is most effective. Active learning supports retention and deeper learning. Transfer is increased when students can practice the learning in multiple settings and contexts. So that's why the skills are on top. So the skill is the thing that we want to have transfer. So if you think about within a scope and sequence, you can have students practice decision making with multiple different content areas, and that's actually going to be more likely to help them transfer that skill into a situation that they haven't encountered yet in their learning. And then finally, participatory methods, which is a critical aspect of skills-based health education, are the methods through which we learn best. Humans inherently learn through these participatory methods of observation, modeling, and social interaction, which are all hallmarks of a skills-based approach. Reason number three, a skills-based health ed approach is informed by research and evidence. So the research tells us that effective health education curricula have skills in common. So when you look at some of the programs that are out there, all of them have skills as a focus in their program. Effective health education curricula often also have a narrow focus of information. So the, so the emphasis in these programs isn't on the information or the facts, it's on the skills. And the programs have thought through what the most important information is that is going to be more likely to support whatever the, the behavior is or goal of that program. Addressing multiple risk factors using a skills-based approach has been shown to be more effective um, through various research studies. And skills-based health education aligns with the characteristics of effective health education curricula from the CDC. So we have these different uh, aspects of the research base that support why a skills-based health education approach makes sense. Reason number four is that a skills-based approach to health education can support social justice and health equity. 
Skills-based health education provides a wonderful opportunity to include social justice and health equity approaches to your programming. However, moving toward a skills-based approach to health education does not inherently mean that you are then doing a social justice approach or that you are addressing health equity. Uh, This work is ongoing over a lifetime. Um, It includes personal examination and reflection, um, and it And it means that you have to intentionally use this lens uh, to look at what you're teaching and how you're teaching. But there is this just rich uh, opportunity when you shift to a skills-based approach to be able to also uh, integrate and um, include and shift to um, a social justice approach. So we do this when we frame health and health education within a broader context. As I mentioned earlier, we have to acknowledge the environment uh, that all of our students are are trying to you know be healthy and well. Um, one of the things that we'd want to look at in our health curriculum are the social determinants of health. So we give students the opportunity to really dive into the conditions in which we live, work, play, worship, age, and grow. Um, Those are the social determinants, and they have a significant influence on our health and wellness. Uh, Some some things that you might see actually show um, that about 70% um, of population health and wellness is due to factors uh, in the environment, not health behaviors. So we have to recognize these social forces that are contributing to health and wellness, We need to address issues such as oppression, racism, discrimination. These all have to be part of our curriculum, both in understanding how these issues impact health, thinking about how we become advocates for social change uh, related to these issues. I mean, there's so much opportunity, um, particularly within the field of health, to really take a a, a hard, critical look um, at these issues and how these issues are shaping people's experiences. Uh, Students can develop skills that support critical inquiry and social change through your skills-based health education program. And as I mentioned earlier, this has to be a personal journey. So you as a teacher have to practice cultural humility is one example. There's there's lots of pieces um, of this journey, but uh, this is something I teach a lot about in my classes, you know, to students who are going into the health professions. But it's this idea of um, being humble when it comes to understanding people and being other oriented so that we are acknowledging the intersectionality that everyone is, is sort of coming to the table with. We're, we're being willing to keep an open mind about people's experiences. We're teaching in a way that we're not saying, oh, you know, that student is X and so therefore I know X, Y, and Z about that student. We're understanding that each person is different, each person's experiences are different, and that in order to be the most effective health educator that we can be, uh, we need to keep that mindset of open-mindedness, of understanding intersectionality, of understanding that everyone is coming to the table with their own experiences, values, all these things, and that we're working to make sure um, that our teaching and that our curriculum and that our pedagogy um, is respectful of each of our students um, and that we are really doing what we need to in order to connect with them and ensure that our programming is um, relevant and supports them as people. Last reason, reason five, don't take our word for it. Here's a quote from a high school health educator. When I see the results after a few years of kids' response to what they learned in class, prime example is the kids who go off to college and every one of them said they remember practicing refusal skills. It makes so much sense. It is like a light goes on when you, when you get into this skills-based health education. From a middle school health educator, what stands out to me this year is the relationship I have with the kids and how they really see value in what we are learning and in the skill. They feel better and more confident in being able to be prepared for the situations that they, in their head, they're like, oh my God, I don't know what to do. But now they're more confident to hopefully make the right decision when they're put into these situations. And from Andy Milne, former National Health Teacher of the Year, it feels awkward, but it's right. And I think that needs to drive teachers forward. If you care about kids and you care about their lifelong health, then it would be wrong of you not to consider skills-based health. So we wanted to end with this because... Teachers who switch to this approach love it. 
They find many benefits to this approach, both personally and professionally, um, from the student perspective, often too from parent uh, perspectives and engagement. So people who are using it are also finding it a meaningful and worthwhile transition to make in their program. And we, we work hard to make sure that teacher voices are always a large part of what we do uh, because you are out there every day doing this and we want to support you um, and let you know that, um, you know, as is mentioned in this quote from Andy, um, that, that it can be difficult. And for some people, this is going to be a pretty significant change in the way that they think about health and they think about teaching. Um, and so it might be a little clunky along the way, um, but that when you get there, um, you will see the benefits and you will be glad that you made the switch. As you get started or as you're going through it, um, Holly and I are both here to help and we want to do the best we can to help everybody um, feel comfortable uh, in this space and help support your ongoing work. Uh, so you can email us, you can find us on Twitter. Um, we do have a blog that has some information um, about skills-based health education. So please, please um, reach out to us if we can help you. Um, like I said, we really wanna be here to support you in this work. And finally, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. I hope you found it helpful, gives you some things to think about. Um, to support why skills-based health ed makes sense. Um, definitely check out Holly's video as well that dives into a little bit more um, about the nuts and bolts of you know, what skills-based health, health ed is and what it looks like. Um, and thank you to Human Kinetics for this opportunity to share this information with all of you.